our school supply drive ends today, and uh, looks like we're building a little goodie here. Um, our hymn sing is going to be August the 20th at 4 p.m. Sarah, Steve, and Sarah's student are going to be participating, right? I'd like to mention uh, Alice is still in the hospital, but they are starting to look for uh, rehab places that they hope to move her to. Uh, Mary Fogel uh, fell at home and had to go to the hospital. She did not break anything, but they're looking for rehab for her also. And let's keep uh, Becky and Ryan's husband in our prayer teams at Glade Valley for rehab. Uh, those are my concerns. Thanks. Anyone else? <laughs> Let's give some extra prayers for Alice. Get her well and out of intensive care. Please join me now in the call to worship. Show us your ways, O oh Lord. Lead us in your truth and teach us. Open our eyes. Reveal your vision for us and keep us focused and faithful to what you would have us do. Bring us together to worship and work for your purpose and move us forward into your future. Amen. Please join me now in the hymn of praise, page 321.
Though we know what is good and often do what is not, God frees us from our guilt so that we might be renewed to accept our potential as part of his very good creation. Today we are sharing with you a sermon entitled, Encountering the Power of Faith. And I trust that that will touch each of us and empower us to be strengthened in our faith. Let me read to you today from Romans and from Psalms. Against all hope, Abraham in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offsprings be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but uh, was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the steps of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night, the person that is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and whose leaves does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so with the wicked. They are like chaff. The wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. <clears throat> Today we are continuing our study in our series about various aspects of a spiritual power and grace. And I want to draw your attention to Abraham and Sarah and some unique uh, things in uh, their particular lives. Faith to be illustrated uh, by early use in electricity. I found this and I thought it was really neat and wanted to share it with you. A particular lady had, uh, in the early days when electricity first came out, had it installed in her house. She only used a couple of units of electricity in several months. The electric company was concerned that something was wrong. So they sent a representative out to check with the lady about uh, the use of her electricity. She declares to him that her electricity is working absolutely perfectly. So he asked her, well, how, what do you do with your electricity and how are you using that? <coughs> and she declares to him every night when it starts getting dark, I cut on the lights so I can see how to light my kerosene lamp, and then I cut the lights off. So naturally, she missed the boat in that one, did she not? But I think we can learn some lessons from that. But too many times, we are like this lady. We are living powerless spiritual lives even though we have unlimited power of God available to us through his word, through our worship and sharing together that can change our lives, our family, and our church. First of all, I'd like to begin with us talking about uh, the principle of faith. Faith is active and working. It is not simply talking about beliefs, but it is actively obedient, obedience that literally practices what one believes in daily lives and relationships. Thus, it receives grace 
to empower us by the Spirit of God to change our own lives as well as to effect change in the lives of other people. Faith is a movement. It is illustrated by walking. One learns as one practices faith what faith is all about and how it changes our hearts and our lives and uh, brings to us the power and grace of God. Faith is a natural process. It's like a toddler. Imagine, and all of us, most of us, have had and raised little children. And as our little toddlers begin to grow, they begin to investigate various aspects of life. They learn to stand. They take a few steps and fall. And they continue in this process moving their feet and their legs until the next thing you know, we cannot stop them. They are running everywhere. And uh, that is a bird's eye view of the process we have of faith. God has called us to walk and to live in his way and in his will. And you and I, as we begin to learn to walk in this life of faith, we uh, experience challenges. Sometimes we blow it, but God continues to empower us by his grace and his strength to make us strong and mature believers in him. Faith is like yeast in bread. When yeast is mixed with dough, it works through the entire lump of the dough and changes the dough into bread that feeds us and nourishes our human body. God instructs Adam and Eve, and also us, that as we learn how to walk in and practice obeying God, we receive God's blessings and God's ability to live the life he has called us to live. Abraham and Sarah faced a lot of challenges, some of which we will look at uh, briefly today. They stumble, but they learn how to walk with God in obedience. And Abraham was one of the greatest patriarchs in our Old Testament that gives us great uh, knowledge and strength in learning how to obey God and walk with God. I'd like to share with you today and call your attention to five promises that God made to Abraham and to Sarah. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7, God says to him, To your offsprings are your seed, I will give this land. This creates hope and expectation in the life of Abraham. God calls him to look around about him, where he is living, the land and what it is and where it is. And God promises him that I will give this to your seed as a land and a homeland forever. He asked Abraham, who walks faithfully and uh, discovers and looks at this land, and uh, I would think obviously prays over this land as God encourages him to take possession of what he chooses to give to him. But perhaps the biggest test that Abraham and Sarah ever faced was the fact that they had received a promise of a son. And yet, Sarah was barren. She was unable to become pregnant and thus to have a son. And they lived their lives in hope and also in disappointments. Soon we discover in Genesis 15 that Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah is 90. I think if I'd been in their shoes, I'd just throw my hands up and say, this is it. <laughs> but they continued to walk in faith. And as they did, God blessed them. He gives them some promises. Genesis 13, 15, and 16. God says to Abraham, I will give to you and your seed all of the land that you see. And they shall be like the dust of the earth, simply meaning incountable. God promised all of this to Abraham, 
and sent Abraham to just look at it, check it out, and uh, to be faithful and a man of faith in believing God to fulfill his promise. Yet, the promise actually did not come into full fulfillment for 430 years in the time of David and uh, King Solomon. And I'm sure there were times when in Abraham's life that he questioned, where is God? Where is the promise? And yet he continually walked in faith, believing that God would do what he said he would do, and ultimately God did that very thing. Secondly, in Genesis 15, verse 2 through 6, God uh, uh, instructs uh, Abraham and, uh, and of dangers and of, uh, of obstacles. Abraham remained childish and, uh, and suggests, using the uh, cultural norms, he names his servant Eli. Azor as his uh, inheritance of his estate. And when he names and makes this a legal document, God responds to him instantly and declares, not this man. He will not be the inheritor of what you own and you possess, but one from your own body, your seed, your son, will uh, become the inheritor of what is yours and of your posterity. <clears throat> God instructs Abraham. Now I want you to slip your feet in his shoes for a minute. Here's a man approaching old age. He has trusted God since he was a young man to give him the son of promise. And yet he never got the son of promise and he is approaching uh, his older, older years. And in chapter 15, God says to Abraham, I got a job for you, brother. I want you to go out, walk around tonight, and I want you to look at all the stars in the sky. Count those stars if you can, and those stars will be a symbol and a promise to you, and they equal all of the sons and the daughters of your posterity. I want you to go down to the seashore. Look at all the grains of sand laying on the seashore. Count them if you can. And those will be the number of your posterity and your children. Here is Abraham approaching 100 years old. He still has no children and no seed. And yet God is saying to him, your posterity will be like the stars of the heavens and like the sand on the seashore. I am wondering how many times did Abraham, in walking with God, putting out all of the effort he knew how in faith, and just shook his head in doubts and wonders, and said, man, I'm getting too old to have a bunch of kids now. And yet God says, my posterity is going to be like the sands of the seashore and the stars in the heaven. And yet the scripture tells us <clears throat> that he believed the Lord when he gave him those promises and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. Next we move to chapter 17 and we deal with uh, another promise. God tells Abraham and uh, as he struggles to believe that he will have a son. And Abraham comes back at him and says, God, is it possible that I can have a son and I'm 100 years old and my wife is 90 years old? We're past that day. And it's impossible for us to have children. And yet the Bible says that Abraham counted this and he says to God or suggests to God, if only Ishmael, the son that I had with Hagar, could live under your blessing. And that be the fulfillment of that. And God responds to Abraham, oh no, that's not the plan. The plan is that you and Sarah, your wife, will have a son, and his name is to be Isaac. <clears throat> now at this time, Sarah is approaching her 90s, and Abraham 
is approaching 100 years old. I think I'd have been like Abraham. I'd say, God, I'm not sure you know what you're talking about. And yet the word tells us Abraham plods on and responds in faith to God, and God honors his faith. Notice next, Genesis 18, the next promise. God says, the Lord says, I will return to you next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. If I was Abraham, I would still shake my head. Who in the creation wants to start having a family and raising children when you're approaching 100 years old and you're thinking my get up to go is that got up and went? And, and when you think about that, it's astounding. And yet, when God spoke to Abraham, the scripture says he believed God. If God said it, God can do it, and God, again, he counts it to him for righteousness. However, the scripture tells us that Sarah laughs. Sarah is thinking in the natural. It is impossible. I'm already past the years of bearing children. Translation, Donna been through menopause. This is not going to happen. I can't have children. I don't care how much God says. This is not the way it's going to be. And I think Abraham was walking more in faith. And Sarah is walking more in the reality of what she knows and sees in her own body and her own life. And not connecting the fact that God can remake her body and give her what he has promised to her. You see, the same God that empowered Abel, Abraham and Sarah is the same God that serves us and serves Thurmont United Church of Christ. And a lot of times you and I look around at our church and uh, our number that is here and our efforts to build this church and to minister to this community. And we think, man, this is a big job. I don't know if we've got all the resources we need and the people we need to get this done. And it's easy to become discouraged. It's easy to look at our numbers and uh, to lose heart and to lose faith. And to say, no, I don't know if we can manage to continue that or not. But we need to look at Abraham and Sarah's faith, right in the face of impossibilities, in the, fa in the face of their bodies and their body clocks have already turned off. And yet God says, you're going to have a son. And some way they were able to believe that, and God honored their faith and gave them a son, Isaac, when they were too old, really, to have children. I want you to know, God, for church, that I believe God wants to bless Thurmont. I know you've had a wonderful and long history. There have been a history of this church, and you, some of you have shared with me, there have been times where not only did you fill the congregation, but you had to open those doors over there and uh, feel part of that room. And sometimes we live in the past. We see what did happen a long time ago. And we feel like we are inadequate for the task that is at hand. I want you to know today the same God that touched Abraham and Sarah when they were 190 and gave them the son of their promise is the same God that is able to quicken us in Thurmont UCC. He is the same God that can give us souls in this church. He is the same God that can empower us to touch, touch Thurmont, to touch our families, to touch our neighbors, and uh, to reach out and invite others to come be with us in this sanctuary on Sunday morning, and we can see a miracle of life even yet in Thurmont UCC. And so I wanna challenge us today and challenge you today, the very same God that worked miracles in the life of Abraham and Sarah is able to work miracles in the life of Thurmont United Church of Christ. May God fill us 
with his hope and with faith, with trust, that we can trust him, walk in him, that we can begin to share with our neighbors and our friends, invite them <coughs> to come and to be in our services, to touch base with some of our former people that was here at other times and, and have fallen kind of by the wayside. Folks, I believe if you and I will put our best foot forward, if you and I will begin to trust God and to touch the lives of other people around about us, our, our children, our grandchildren, our neighbors, our friends, I believe that we also can see new life here and that we can grow this church again to bless God and to bless this community in this church. I surely trust and ask you this day, let us determine that we will act in faith in facing also what we struggle with, that we will look beyond that and touch God and let God touch our hearts and our minds and fill us with his grace, with his strength, with a new life, and that we might work together to see this church grow, to see new people here, to see young people here, and uh, that we might touch this city and uh, build it for the kingdom and the grace of God. If you believe that is a possible thing, please say amen. Now what we have to do is do. And I believe if we will begin, and if we will begin to touch our neighbors, touch our families, touch our friends, I believe God is going to bless us with some growth in this church and give new life <clears throat> to Thurmont UCC just as God gave new life to Abraham and Sarah with the gift of their son. May God bless us, may God strengthen us, and may his power and his will work in and through us to touch others. In Jesus' name, amen.
the living in Christ, the gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. He appeared to Mary Magdalene and on the same day sat at the table with two disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of bread. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and neat, beautiful and holy, that we should in sense, ceaseless joy give our thanks and praise to you, O holy and merciful God, through Jesus Christ our Savior. And so in the grateful procession of endless praise within the church that is, was, and shall forever be, we glorify you. Let us pray. Holy are you, Eternal One. You sit above and within the circle of the earth, setting light into being, casting the stars in the sky, founding the evolving earth and all that dwells in it. Limitless is your power and great is your wisdom. You look upon the lowly and your most cherished creatures. You visit the downtrodden with grace and the promise of eternal justice. You send to us your only child, Jesus, who reached into unexpected places, calling women, men, and children into your holy embrace. And so we call that on the night of betrayal, in desertion, the light of the world took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, <clears throat> This is my body that is broken for you. And in this manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks to them, saying, This is the cup of the New Test New Covenant poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. Like the great, greatest feast is before us, we expectantly proclaim, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again.
This juice today represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ when he was crucified, hung on the cross. He gave his life and his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, that we might be embodied into his body and become his sons and his daughters. Let us offer thanksgiving to him. Lord Christ, we thank you so much today that you loved us so much that you came into this world and lived, that you chose to give your life and to die upon a cruel cross, that we might have your life embedded within us, and that we might live with you for eternity. We offer thanksgiving and grace to you, O oh God, for the gift of your blood. Let us partake together. Christ's greatest feast is before us. We excitedly proclaim Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Let us join in our service singing together the King of Love, my shepherd is. Let us pray. We have been fed, O Holy One, by your presence. We have been led, Eternal One, by your light. May we bask in this glow now and forevermore. Amen. Lord God, we thank you today for the opportunity and the privilege that we have together in this, your house. To worship you, to give honor and glory to you, to hear your word and to be challenged and sent forth back to our own homes, back to our communities. And I ask that you will bless us and inspire us by your grace, your peace, and your strength, that we might share you, O oh God, to our neighbors, our friends, and our family. We ask that you will multiply this church as we share your love and your others around about us and our neighborhoods and wherever we go. We ask today that you will bless us as we worship you, fill us with your goodness, your grace, and your peace. Lord God, we lift up to you today, <clears throat> Alice, and we thank you for your great grace and healing power in her body, the way you're continuing to bring healing to her. And we ask that you will completely raise her up and send her back again that she might share with us. Oh God, for others who may be sick, connected with our church family and our friends, we ask that you will bless them by the healing power of Jesus Christ and give them renewed strength and renewed grace. We ask you today that you will bless and anoint us as your sons and your daughters, that you will send us back to our homes today and place upon us your loving concern for souls around about us, that we might speak to our neighbors, to our friends, to uh, others we meet as we move around in life, and that we might share with them your love and your grace, that we might invite them to come and be a part of our family and who we are, and worship you together as we worship you. We ask that you will grant us growth, and that you will bless us, O oh God, as we worship you and as we serve this community in this local area. In Christ's name. <clears throat> now join me, turning to page 518, and let us sing together, Savior again, and I hear name. Correction, it's 519. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs>
Lord God, we ask today that you will dismiss us in your loving kindness and in your grace. That you will go home with us and that you will empower and enable us this week to share your goodness, your grace, and your mercies with those with whom we interact and those in our own community where we live. Dismiss us today in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.